Good morning, Coach Slack here once again, continuing our readings on the Synaxedian, the lives of the saints of the Orthodox Church. Today's a big one for me. Um, if you've been following along my other readings, I've been doing uh, The Ladder of Divine Ascent by St. John Climacus. And today, on the 30th day of March, we cel celebrate the memory of our venerable and God-bearing father, John of Sinai, called Climacus. This wonderful man was probably born in the second half of the 6th century, but his country and his origins are alike unknown because, from the beginning of his renunciation of the world, he took great care to live as a stranger upon earth. Exile, he wrote, is a separation from everything, in order that one may hold on totally to God. We only know that, from the age of 16, after having received a solid intellectual formation, he renounced all the pleasures of this vain life for love of God and went to Mount Sinai, to the foot of the holy mountain on which God had in former times revealed his glory to Moses and consecrated himself to the Lord with a burning heart as a sweet-smelling sacrifice. Setting aside from the moment of his entry into the stadium all self-trust and self-satisfaction through unfeigned humility, he submitted body and soul to an elder called Martyrius, and set himself free from all care to climb that spiritual ladder, Climax, at the top of which God stands, and to add fire each day to fire, fervor to fervor, zeal to zeal. He saw his shepherd as the image of Christ, and convinced that his elder was responsible for him before God, he had only one care, to reject his own will, and with all deliberateness, to put aside the capacity to make his own judgment so that no interval passed between Martyrius's commands, even those that appeared unjustified, and the obedience of his disciple. In spite of this perfect submission, Martyrius kept him as a novice for four years and only tonsured him when he was twenty, after having tested his humility. Strategius, one of the monks present at the tonsure, predicted that the new monk would one day become one of the great lights of the world. When, later, Martyrius and his disciple paid a visit to John the Sabai, one of the most famous ascetics of the time, the latter, ignoring the elder, poured water over John's feet. And after they had left, John the Sabai declared that he did not know the young monk, but, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he had washed the feet of the abbot of Sinai. The same prophecy was confirmed by the great, by the great Anastasius the Sinai, whom they also went to visit. In spite of his youth, John showed the maturity of an elder and great discernment. Thus one day, when he had been sent into the world on a mission, and finding himself with lay people, he had preferred to give in somewhat to vainglory by eating very little, rather than to gluttony. For, of those two evils, it was better to choose that which is less dangerous for beginners in monastic life. He thus passed nineteen years in the blessed freedom from care that obedience gives, freed from all conflict by the prayer of his spiritual father, and on a safe voyage, a sleeper's journey, moved towards the harbor of impassibility. On the death of Martyrius, he resolved to continue his ascension in solitude, a type of life suitable for only a small number who, made strong on the rock of humility, flee from others so as not to be even for a moment deprived of the sweetness of God. He did not commit himself to this path, one so full of snares, on his own judgment, but on the recommendation of the holy elder George Erasalates, who instructed him in the way of life proper to Hezekast. As his exercise ground, he chose a solitary place called Tholas, situated five miles from the main monastery, where other hermits lived, each not far from the others. He stayed there for forty years, consumed by an ever-increasing love of God, without thought for his own flesh, free of all contact with men, having unceasing prayer and vigilance as his only occupation. In order to keep his incorporeal self shut up in the house of the body, as an angel clothed in a body, he used to eat all that was compatible with his monastic profession, but in very small quantities thus subduing the tyranny of the flesh while not providing a pretext for vainglory. By living in solitude and retreat, he put to death the mighty flame of the greed, which, under the pretext of charity and hospitality, leads negligent monks to gluttony, the door to all the passions. 
and through love of money, a worship of idols, and the offspring of unbelief, he triumphed over sloth, acedia, that death of the soul which attacks Hezekiah in particular, and laxity by the remembrance of death. By meditating on eternal rewards, he undid the chain of sadness. He knew only a single sadness, that affliction which leads to joy and makes us run with ardor along the path of repentance, purifying the soul from all of its impurities. What still prevented him from arriving at impassibility, apathia, he had long since conquered anger by the sword of obedience. He had suffocated vainglory, that three-pointed thorn which forever harasses those who battle for holiness, and which entwines itself with every virtue like a leech, by solitude and even more by silence. As a reward for his labors, which he took care to season constantly with self-accusation, the Lord gave him the queen of the virtues, holy and precious humility, a grace in the soul, and with a name known only to those who have had experience of it, a gift from God. As his cell was too near the others, he would often withdraw a distant, to a distant cave at the foot of the mountain, which he made an antechamber of heaven by his groans and the tears which fell effortlessly from his eyes like an abundant spring, transfiguring his body as with a wedding garment. By this blessed affliction and these continual tears, he did not cease to celebrate daily, and kept a perpetual prayer in his heart, which had become like an inviolable fortress against the assaults of evil thoughts, logismi. Sometimes he was ravished in spirit in the midst of the angelic choirs, not knowing if he was in the body or out of it, and then with great simplicity he asked God to teach him about the mysteries of theology. When he came out of the furnace of prayer, he sometimes felt purified as if by fire, and sometimes totally radiant with light. As for sleep, he allowed himself just the measure necessary to keep his spirit vigilant in prayer, and before sleeping he prayed at length, or wrote down on tablets the fruit of his meditations on the inspired scriptures. He took great care over many years to keep his virtues hidden from human eyes, but when God judged that the time had come for him to transmit the others the light which he had acquired for the edification of the church, he led a young monk named Moses to John, <clears throat> who thanks to the intervention of the other ascetics, succeeded in overcoming the resistance of the man of God and was accepted as his disciple. One afternoon, when Moses had gone a long way away to find earth for their little garden and had lain down under a large rock to rest, Abba John in his cell received the revelations that Moses was in danger, and he immediately seized a weapon of prayer in the evening when Moses returned, he told John that in his sleep he had, all of a sudden, heard the voice of his elder calling him at the very moment when the rock began to break away from its moorings and threatened to crush him. St. John's prayer also had the power to heal visible and invisible wounds. It was thus that he delivered a monk from the demon of lust, which had pushed him to the point of despair. On another occasion, he made rainfall. Yet it was above all in the gift of spiritual teaching that God manifested his grace in him. Basing his teaching on his personal experience, he generously instructed all those who came to him on the snares which lay in wait for monks in their battle against the passions and against the prince of this world. This spiritual teaching, however, attracted the jealousy of some who then spread around calumnies about him, accusing him of being a conceited chatterer. Although his conscience was clear, Abba John did not attempt to justify himself, but, seeking rather to take away any pretext from those who sought one, he stopped teaching for a whole year, convinced that it was better to do some slight harm to his friends rather, to, rather than to exasperate the resentment of the wicked. All the inhabitants of the desert were edified at his silence and by this proof of humility, and it was only at the insistence of his repentant calumniators that he re agreed to receive vis visitors again. <clears throat> Filled with all the virtues of action and contemplation, and having arrived at the summit of the holy ladder through victory over all of the passions of the old man, St. John shone like a star on the Sinai Peninsula, 
and was held in awe by all the monks. He thought himself no less of a beginner for all that, and, avid to find examples of evangelical conduct, undertook journeys to various Egyptian monasteries. He visited, in particular, a great Cenobitic monastery in the region of Alexandria, a veritable earthly paradise, which was governed by a shepherd gifted with infallible discernment. This brotherhood was united by such charity in the Lord, exempt from all familiarity and useless talk, that the monks had scarcely need of the warnings of their superior, for they mutually encouraged each other to a most divine vigilance. Of all their virtues, the most admirable, according to John, was the way they especially were careful never to injure a brother's conscience in the slightest. He was also very edified by a visit to a dependency of this monastery called the prison, where monks who had gravely sinned lived in extreme assises and gave extraordinary proofs of repentance, straining by their labors to receive God's forgiveness. Far from appearing as hard and intolerable, this prison seemed rather to the saint to be the model of monastic life, a soul that has lost its one-time confidence and abandoned its hope of dispassion, that has broken the seal of chastity, that has squandered the treasury of divine graces, that has become a stranger to divine consolation, that has rejected the Lord's command, and that is wounded and pierced by sorrows, as it remembers all this, will not only take on the labors mentioned above with all eagerness, but will even decide devoutly to kill itself with penitential works. It will do so if there is in it only the tiniest spark of love or of fear of the Lord. When a saint had sojourned these forty years in the desert, he was charged by God like a second Moses to be at the head of this new Israel by becoming abbot of the monastery at the foot of the holy mountain. It is recounted that on the day of his enthronement, Six hundred pilgrims were present, and when they were all seated for the meal, the great prophet Moses himself, dressed in a white tunic, could be seen coming and going, giving orders with authority to the cooks, the sellers, the stewards, and the other helpers. <clears throat> Having penetrated into the mystical darkness of contemplation, this new Moses having been initiated into the secrets of the spiritual law and coming back down the mountain impassable, his face transfigured by divine grace, was able to become for all the shepherd, the physician, and the spiritual master. Carrying within him the book written by God, he did not have need of other books to teach his monks the science of sciences and the art of arts. The abbot of Rathu, who was also named John, Having been informed of the wonderful manner of life of the monks of Sinai, wrote to St. John, asking him to explain briefly, but in a methodical way, what those who had embraced the angelic life should do in order to be saved. He who did not know how to go against the wishes of another, thus engraved with the stylus of his own experience the tablets of the spiritual law. He presented his treatise as a ladder of thirty steps that Jacob, who he who supplanted the passions contemplated while he was lying on the bed of Assisi's. In this orthodox summa of the spiritual life, which has remained for centuries the outstanding guide to evangelical living, both for monks and for lay people, St. John does not institute rules, but by practical recommendations, judiciously chosen details and short pithy maxims and riddles, often full of humor, he initiates the soul into spiritual combat and discernment of thoughts. <clears throat> His word is brief, dense, and tapered, and it penetrates like a sword to the depths of the soul, uncompromisingly cutting out all self-satisfaction -satisfa and tracing hypocritical ascesis and egoism to their roots. Like that of St. Gregory in the theological domain, this word is the gospel put into practice and will lead most surely those who let themselves by impregnated by it through an assiduous reading to the gates of heaven where Christ awaits us. At the end of his life, the blessed John designated his brother George, who had embraced the Hezekast life from the beginning of his renunciation as his successor at the head of the monastery. When he was about to die, George said to him, So you are abandoning me and leaving. 
<clears throat> I prayed, however, that you would send me to the Lord first, for without you I cannot shepherd this brotherhood. But St. John reassured him and said, Do not grieve and do not be afraid. If I find grace before God, I shall not let you complete even a year after me. And it was so. Ten months after John's falling asleep, George departed in his turn unto the Lord. Uh, there were a few uh, icons during the reading. First one's uh, from the monastery of Mount Sinai from the 12th century. <clears throat> there was another one from the Codex Vatican, also from the 11th century. And finally, there was one in color from the Monastery of Sinai from the 15th century. Through the prayers of thy saints, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. Amen.